I am not. This is part of the talk that I give, but I'm not going to talk about Moto's uh, uh, introduction, etc., because all you guys are know more about it than I do. And and so um, I'll tell you what prompted us to think about this problem. What prompted us to think about this problem was actually originally we were playing around with Kinesin, which we still are, and conventional Kinesin. And in the course of getting a model for that, uh, uh, including just like the experimental setup with the microtubule, a few further elements of that, um, uh, and, and cargo, coil, coil, etc. That was done by this last guy, who now uh, not uh, he's in Harvard. Uh, we noted that, that um, after this head detaches, at least within the things that we are based, uh, uh, focused on, uh, the diffusion consumed a considerable amount of the step. If you parse that into, into diffusion and sun, and then finally when it's close to the next binding site, uh, most of the time, and in fact the distances it covers are largely diffusive. And then we cooked up a toy model that I mean, one that I thought we could solve analytically, and and uh, and it turned out I'm not going to get into that. There's some problems, and we couldn't do that. So we, at the point, decided that uh, it's perhaps easy to do this with myosin five, uh, because the actin filament could essentially be viewed as a uh, quasi one-dimensional with the helical structure, spacing of 36 millimeters, say. And then uh, you could treat the lever arm using some sort of a polymer model. And you can dissect this stepping into two pieces, one that just depends upon the architecture, namely the persistence length of this lever arm, uh, how long it is, um, and some sort of interaction between the head and the, uh, and the, and the, uh, and the actin, and then there's a the other part, which we sort of call chemistry, which is a chemomechanical cycle uh, involving the two, uh, two heads. And that's, uh, uh, that's something that, that, that we could work out. I would say for the purposes of this talk, an exact solution, but it's not theoretically exact. And, uh, and if you want, I can explain what I mean that it's not theoretically exact. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to tell you about. And maybe, maybe this, and maybe the, I'll first go to this Kinesin. Maybe it, I don't know. The movie doesn't work. Uh, maybe it works. I don't know. See so now is, I'm showing you Kinesin an experimental setup, and you can see one head is tethered by design, and the other one is moving. There's this gray thing where it says force is a cargo. With this we could calculate things like. Um, uh, uh, the position of the cargo is a function of time compared to some experiments, uh, mostly by Rob Cross, uh, and which was published about 12 years ago, I think. And, uh, and you can see that it's a really a largely diffuse mesh. All right. Um, so this, this is a myosin 5. That's what we're going to work about. And then Maro is going to talk about myosin 6. Uh, uh, how does this go here? I want to go to the next. No, 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 I want to go, is that, should I put, no, I want to go, advance my slide, right? So, uh, yeah, okay, this is just to remind you, there's a system we're going to deal with, uh, uh, these are your single molecule units that I all think they're with, forget about all this stuff. Um, nice and six. Oh, yeah, this is a length scale that will be important, although, uh, uh, um, so, so the, 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 the contour length of the lever arm um, is in this range of, say, 30 to 50 nanometers. And it's a relatively stiff chain. We kind of estimated this number to be somewhere between this and 100 to 400. And I believe that uh, these are not, uh, they're, they're in the range that uh, that uh, Sean and uh, uh, Yale Goldman's review more or less says that. I, I hope that's correct. Um, the, the motor domain. Is of course a folded protein, uh, it's got nucleotide binding sites, uh, which is quite far away from the actin binding sites, and it's a small globular protein, say if you separate it, so what, uh, three, three, let's say two to three nanometers. So these are length scales that'll sort of play a role in what I'm going to tell you. So these are all stuff. <laughs> so this, this is a mistake I made, Yale, as you remember, if 
is there. As you remember, when I when I gave the talk, uh, I did not have Gail's name here, and uh, and uh, when I first and then I came to see him, the first thing he showed me was a science paper, in which of course he was a uh, uh, he was an important player. Uh, so it's really experiments coming from him at the time in collaboration with Paul Selwyn. Illitz was now mostly doing dynein, and these are very lovely experiments and. Uh, you can essentially see uh, attaching. I, I recognize the, the details, and what struck us was that the dispersion in the step size distribution is relatively narrow. I believe the Keynesian is even narrower, but it's very narrow. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the theory at the time when we did it did not reproduce the step size distribution. The subsequent development, we in fact have produced a theory that actually. Uh, based upon what I'm going to tell you, um, that that actually gives the step size distribution. So we sort of understand this not only for, uh, although I'm going to focus on this uh, wild type mycin with six eigenmotives constituting the lever arms. Um, Jim Sellers has done experiments with uh, two, four, six, and eight, and the step size distributions are different. Our theory gets almost all of it completely right, and that'll, that'll be for another day, uh, perhaps. OK. Um, so this is a cycle. And what we really want to do is to look at what happens in the step when um, ADP is actually released. And uh, when, I was, when, we, when we met last uh, uh, a week or two weeks ago, I was talking about gating in Marlson 6. That's something that Mauro has done, which is just working through it, and it's applicable to uh, myosin 5 as well. So when ATP binds, um, uh, it can bind to either the leading head or the trailing head, but it preferentially binds to, let's say, on the zero force and so on and so forth, the leading head, and that's a gating stuff that I'm not going to tell you about. And once it detaches, it's now undergoing diffuser search. There's a whole circle or something like that shows that, and that's the stuff that I want to describe to you in terms of the theory. And at some point in between, as Enrique de la Cruz and others showed, that uh, there are some confirmation changes that take place where it's hydrolyzed and then the, 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 there's a recovery stroke uh, uh, that poises the head to, 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 to bind in the right orientation uh, in, uh, in, in, the for, for, in the forward direction. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Let me see, this is all real, this is all not very really useful. Things. Uh, one thing maybe I should say is that uh, this, this motor, like others, can uh, walk with, with uh, um, resistive force. It has uh, all forces of between two and three picometers. And uh, there, are, there are arguments about efficiencies based on 2 times 36 and how much ATP energy is provided. And you see that the efficiency is extremely high if you compute things like that. Um, OK, these are all very good. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, everyone has seen this, and, and, uh, and but uh, it's really. Um, there were, you know, prior to the uh, Goldman um, Selwyn paper in Science about 14 years ago now. Though I think it, it may be the case that uh, Reef, when he was a postdoc with Jim Spillage, maybe knew that Mice and Pi walks hand over hand. But the 2003 paper, this full any notion that it could work by any other mechanism, such as, such as inchworm and so on and so forth, take small steps and big steps, et cetera, in, in any order you want. And, and, but this is really the most direct movie of Myosin 5, from, coming from Ondo, but seven years ago, um, using AFM. And you can even see the time scale under which this uh, this happens. Um, this is exactly the kind of experiments people do. Your actin is uh, on the cover slip, and uh, you, you have uh, mice and fire, and he's trying to catch the location of the uh, of the uh, of the motor as it's stepping, and he succeeded to do that. And that's a movie that you you now see, and and uh, um, and you can there's zero doubt the head is illuminated, and there's zero doubt. It's executing this motion with a so-called hand-over-hand mechanism. So you don't need any explanation, analysis, or 
or backtracking after that. I mean, at least in this uh, in this construct, which may be which may be artificial because acting is um, on a surface. That this is indeed the case. All right. So all these things I'm telling you that you don't you know already. Okay. So this 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 is what this is the beginning of our. Oops. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip. On. I think I know. I'm gonna go here. So at the end of the day, when we actually begin the calculation, actin will be one dimension, where the lattice spacing that's fixed for these calculations, in order to do the step distributions, we had to relax that, and we could. And then the uh, lever arm, and you see six IK motives in this, uh, I don't know, what is it? Um, ellipsoidal structures connected, uh, is modeled as a stiff chain. The head is, is blue, very dark blue, and there's a junction with head and arm. In the beginning, if uh, I, I, when, when APP is wrong, uh, to both the heads, let's say that's the starting state, resting state, and most of the time it spends time there, as uh, Goldman Selden movie showed, uh, later showed a long time ago. And um, the orientation of these guys are all pointing uh, in the minus direction, and then uh, and the, and the cycle begins when ATP binds. Um, and uh, this paper by uh, Della Cruz and uh, he just showed that. Uh, upon ATP hydrolysis, uh, there's a recovery stroke in which the, the, the head seems to rotate with respect to the, uh, the uh, lever arm, and then it binds later on uh, to the forward step. And this, of course, assumes the force. There's no resistance to force. It's in the absence of force. And and uh, so these are the uh, nominally believed to be the two sources of uh, 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 that favor unidirectional motion. One is the leading head power stroke, which is in red, and yeah, the recovery stroke that is uh, me surprisingly only discovered four years ago in that particular paper. Okay, um, that's what happens in the forward stepping. But what the movie that I showed you of uh, Ongo also pointed out, maybe it doesn't know him before, but I don't know, that the the, the trailing head, which preferentially detaches, need not go forward, but can rebind to the same starting point. And in the process, of course, um, and then this assumes, of course, ADP binds. So it's and, and that's something that that one can sort out with the kind of analysis that Mauro is, 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 has done in the last few months. Um, then if ATP binding is extremely fast, and therefore it binds, but if you have to rebind back, then it, ADP, ATP has to idolize. And so it rebinds with uh, ADP and inorganic phosphate still in the nucleotide binding site. But it has an incorrect orientation, because nominally it would have to go in the forward direction. And so, in the theory, we associate, we assign a bending binding penalty for that. Okay, so that's a second pathway. Then, likewise, you can have the leading head foot stomp, which is a bit more frequent compared to uh, the trailing head foot stomp, and you'll see this um, emerging in the calculation. And of course, it can also move backwards. So, what we set ourselves to do. In order to understand the architectural basis of this motor, was to first use the theory to make very as quantitative a prediction as possible with as few parameters as possible. Okay, that's, once we do that, then we can see uh, we can create phase diagrams in any uh, variable that we want. Okay, so these are the goals. Uh, and I'm going to show you how the calculation is done. Describe how the probabilities of myosin Kennedy pathways vary under load. And to my, to my, the best of my knowledge, uh, those have not been executed for all the four pathways that I showed you in the previous uh, uh, slide. And then we're going to try to reproduce uh, lots of things like uh, uh, force velocity curves, 
um, stall floors and, and so on and so forth. And the last one is really what started our, our project, and we have some suggestions that which may be interesting to, uh, for someone to think about. That. All right, so the, now everything is ugly because we're not uh, being faithful uh, to, um, to the uh, 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 internal structures of the motor, lever arm, etc., etc. Um, the green lines with the spacing uh, that's supposed to be spacing between the two are 36 nanometers. And the blue guys are the lever arms. There is a constraint strength with which the heads bind to actin. And that's denoted by nu c, just the parameter. The angle between the head-on junction associated with the binding of the head to the actin is theta of the substrate c. We guessed, I don't know how, I, that to be 60 degrees, but we now, we knew then when we wrote the paper, there were EM images, which basically show it's about 50, pi or something like that. But it's an analytic theory that we can do whatever we want. Then uh, you can see that the, the point is to apply the resistive force. Nominally, you know, an experiment would be applied to, um, uh, in an optical tweezer anyway, to a cargo. Uh, um, and, and it's applied at an angle with respect to the head, to junction between the two, two lower arms. It's uh, a specific way that theta with the stuff to death. The structural parameters that are input into the theory are the ones that I already showed you that uh, L uh, and really the ratio of L over LP. And the diffusivity of the chain of the head once it detaches from, 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 from actin. In fact, uh, um, Stokes Einstein suffices, and that gives you this number 6 times 10 to the minus 7 centimeters per second. But you could argue that, that that it's really not an independent head of three nanometers that's diffusing in a water viscosity, but it's really something that's attached to the lever arm, and it, that's a semi-flexible chain, but you can you can work that out as well, and then find there's a program called HydroPro that will do it for you if you don't want to do it analytically, and the number is not that different from here, yeah, from this. So, I would say that the L, L, P, and DH, although are parameters in the theory, uh, but they are really are uh, uh, very easily determined. The first one, two especially, because if I model the Cal modulin, uh, the IQ motive says um, uh, the lower arm has a somewhat flexible chain, I can compute that. <coughs> the next set of parameters, of course, is specifically model dependent. And theta C, I already told you, is about 50 by degrees or 60 degrees. This new C is 184, but it doesn't matter if you make it 100 to 200. It doesn't matter. Since this is a semi-flexible chain, uh, the energy of a semi-flexible chain would uh, be proportional to the bending energy squared. And the bending energy, in this case, can be written as tangent vector at any point along the along the lever arm. And with the proviso, because it's a tangent vector, u squared must be equal to 1. And that puts a constraint on the semi-flexible chain. And that makes the problem very difficult to solve. And this is what I meant by it's almost analytic in places. But, but there was some method that we devised that we could actually do this. Okay, so that's your uh, that's the structural form. Okay, I must tell you just because of uh, uh, you know Michael Michael is, is my friend and um, a tremendously accomplished physicist. They actually, uh, um, along with this postdoc, wrote a series of papers which many others have followed. Rather than taking this tact that I'm telling you, they basically wanted to understand various experimental aspects of both myosin and kinesin using. Stochastic kinetic models. I don't think I have them, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's here, and and uh, and and they're successful in uh, in uh, matching many things with experiments, especially in kinesin, where they focused a lot on 
data coming from Steve Locke's laboratory, like random parameters. Um, uh, velocity is a function of ATP and things like that. Okay. Um, in many conversations, Michael, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I I argued that, that, that those kinetic models, uh, wonderful as they are, but they're mathematically quite complicated and simply as, as in a lot of stuff that Yale has done shows, um, uh, uh, there, is, there is no structural sort of insights you can get from that. Not that you can get one from us, but that's a little bit better, I think, and so we, and it's a different approach. There are connections between the two, which we have not sorted out. I think Mauro may have sorted out some connections, but I don't know. I didn't even try. All right. <clears throat> So then, those are those architectural parameters. The chemical uh, the, uh, the rates coming from the chemo-mechanical cycle, we read off from, um, from experiments, and you could be in some range. And, and there are some subtle things that actually was pointed out to me uh, um, uh, I, during my first trip to Penn a few years, three years ago, maybe. Um, about uh, the hydrolysis rate changing depending upon the light chains and heavy chains. And uh, uh, shortly upon my return, and this is just sort of information for Yale, I worked out everything and I started writing a paper that, that was not done, but, but the center will, this, the existence of the center will definitely force me to complete that exercise. Um, so, and, and we can work that out. Uh, um, the theory, uh, essentially, you'll see TH and TD, et cetera, et cetera, and you can substitute whatever you want. The, the gating ratio, as it were, which is the probability that the turning head detaches upon ATP binding in preference to the leading head, is just given by these detachment rates and the ratios about 8 and 10. There are, if these numbers are, oh yeah, the, this is the, the, the theory also says, uh, when do I decide that the step is complete, um, assuming that the spacing is fixed, um, when, when, uh, when the trailing head comes somewhere close to the binding side and the tolerance is about a nanometer. Again, it's something that you can vary. Um, with that, there are just two parameters, normally, namely the strength of the constraint strength and the binding penalty, that's it. Right. So the theory and beyond these things that I didn't take too much time. So this is really uh, um, not for, uh, this is just to tell you that uh, this sort of calculation requires analytic theories because the time scales, I mean computer simulations of the MD variety, which are interesting to do, um, are more or less useless for the, the things that I'm going to tell you and also the things that Mara will tell you in the context of minus and six. And that's because the time scale ranges from about a microsecond uh, to, to a second or something like that. All right. And this is a technical piece, and I'm going to skip it. So the theory is uh, uh, somewhat complicated, but the end, oh yeah, so, so what, what, what we really want to do is one say the, one of the heads, and let's just focus on the trailing head, detaches from uh, filament is acting, then the task is to actually first calculate mean first passage time by diffusive process that it takes for this trailing head to go in three-dimensional space with the angle between the uh, two lever arms completely unconstrained. And I'll make a comment on, on that in, uh, in light of some experiment of uh, from Jim Sellers a uh, year or two ago, in a second. And and then, so, so again, let me, uh, that is a side remark that may confuse what do we want to do. It's a mean time that the trailing head will take from leaving that spot at minus delta Z dagger, as it says here, which is R minus, to go to R plus, which is about 72 nanometers away, resulting in a net gain of about 36 nanometers. That's the job. Okay. And, and, and the plus and minus means that uh, uh, that a leading head the tra uh, leading head can also go back. So it's on the plus part, 
and the only difference is in one quantity. This is really something that you can write down with dimensional analysis, which is what we did in the beginning. Uh, and if you know, if you're familiar with Smolikowski theory for diffusion times, this is very similar to that. But the denominator contains the usual terms of diffusivity and the capture radius. When do you say that the reaction is this particular case, the binding is complete. The only, the new thing that comes in here is uh, the probability that the trailing head is in the vicinity of R plus, which is in the forward direction. This formula uh, makes one assumption that the time scale for my, and the red thing, the, 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 the mean first passage time, is um, a lot slower than any relaxation, uh, any other relaxation processes. And that's a technicality that you remember. As an aside, if there is a student or two listening, I would say that this formula will, can be used, for example, to calculate what the time scale for two ends of a polymer to come close together uh, of any kind, because all you need is this probability. For our setup, where this is executing a processive motion with the leading head always bound and the trailing head is the one going, uh, uh, moving in the forward or backward direction, this probability is non trivial to calculate because for a semi flexible chain, I got to respect this uh, tangent vector being equal to unity and it makes this life complicated. But you can devise approximate, approximate uh, expressions for that, and that's what we did. And you get this um, square box, and it's complicated and ugly. You can, uh, and, and remember that this, in, 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 this, in this formula here, it's only the first passage time, and there's no um, chemomechanical cycle embedded here at all. And, and, and it's, it's not equal to the binding time. It's just this is the first passage time. How long it takes for this to get in the vicinity of the leading binding site. And hence, it only depends upon some structural parameter. And it depends on the ratio of uh, um, the persistence length of the lever arm to, 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 to the contour length. And uh, we determine this to be the, we call this a power stroke effectiveness. It's purely structural. And if I, this is another uh, thing that you can ask how much uh, um, elastic energy is stored as a result of all this persistence length, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's about half of the ATP hydrolysis. So this, it's under tension when it's there, and the tension value is about 10 kT. So coming back to this guy, in the absence of force, the motor, in my some fine in particular, is, is preferentially going towards the plus end, which means the ratio of the time scale of the first passage time to the of oh, the leading, trailing head going there and the leading head going back must be uh, 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 in favor of the forward motion. And that's what you see in this formula at the top. That if I put F equal to zero, uh, then uh, the external force is zero. Then you can see that I want uh, for a given delta, which is 36 nanometers, that's fixed by God, and, uh, and, uh, and the contour length. You want this T to be as large as possible, and the T is this combination of the persistence line, uh, and L and the strength of the constraint. The mean binding time now involves chemistry, and that's given by these two, 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 two little formulas in the, in the, in the black, um, and they involve chemistry because they involve hydrolysis rates for both the trailing head binding the forward direction. And, uh, and 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 the, and the backward step as well. And uh, and then you can you can see that for all other quantities that are measurable, namely the ratio of the probability of going forward to backward, they all involve a combination of both the first passage time determined purely by structural terms in our theory and in any event, and and uh, and chemistry like gating ratio, binding penalty, etc. 
So. So now, um, this the graphs that I'm going to show you here. To the best of my knowledge, except for the forward and the backward step, I think have not been measured. Though that means the stomping stuff has not been. So if I now plot the probability of going forward, so trailing at the test goes forward, like shown on the bottom, as a function of the resistive force. At zero force, and it kind of looks like 0.95 or something like that, right? 95 percent chances are that it goes in the forward direction, and then it comes down at some point. The trailing in foot stomp is extremely rare. That's what I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, and and uh, uh, until you exceed about a bigger newton of force, and then then you see that there's increases. Then the leading head foot stomp is, uh, is, is, is possible, more likely than the uh, at small forces, and, uh, and, and, and decreases uh, as would be expected if you keep on increasing applying resistive force. And this is the backwards of probability. And when the green, the red, and the blue intersect somewhere, the, those two forward and the backwards are the same, and, uh, and that's what 50, 50, roughly speaking. That determines something like the star moves. And then we have one minus the sum of the, all this is, is spontaneous uh, detachment, and that terminates, terminates, terminates the walk. All right. Um, this is, uh, I believe, from Warshaw's group. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and there's a ratio of the backward to the forward step. and. Um, I think on the saturating ATP concentration, but I don't, know. I don't remember that so well. And you can see that when that becomes 0.5, that determines the stall force, and I'm looking at 1.8 and 7, 1.8, something like that. Let's say two Um And this, yeah, it's, it's 100 micromole. It's not saturating. So it's not saturating, I'm sorry. Um, this is uh, uh, the black guy is the theory. Um, the, the purples are the experiments, and the theory does pretty well. Um, I think there are mechanisms by which we can even deal with uh, changing buffer concentration and the, to see if the electrostatic effects are important. But I, don't, I have not seen too many experiments there. This is a force velocity curve, and uh, well, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six people doing experiments. Certainly two millimolar, one millimolar, one millimolar are saturating. But there's a lot of dispersion in experiments. I've never understood why, but that's where life is. Um, and uh, our theory basically shows uh, um, that at least uh, it's, it's not horrible. Matthias Reef, uh, in, um, he did this uh, very low ATP. I don't, I don't know what low ATP. There are only two crosses there, the green crosses. At one peak of Newton and then some superstar force, he, uh, he can see that uh, there is some issues about uh, the velocity being negative. But, but since there are only two points uh, for, uh, for, for experiments, but we could, uh, out theory, you know, at least those two points are not horrible, although we have not spend too much time trying to understand what that means when you, what, what, what happens to the motor when you're under superstar conditions, which is certainly three peak of Okay, and and then you can see that the detachment rate is uh, uh, is is less than for the uh, higher ATP concentrations. All right, this methodology uh, uh, of dark field uh, microscopy with attaching this gigantic gold particle, which is bigger than anything else in the in the in the, in the system, was first used by. Um, Alex Danman, he was a postdoc of Jim Spudich. Um, and, and they were trying to look at uh, what should happen in a single step as opposed to these experiments which show um, an increase in steps. Um, and, and uh, uh, OK, so what they show is in the bottom that the trailing kind of detaches, like it's kind of like a, a horse that has been bottled up 
uh, cage for a long time. It just shoots out, and then uh, uh, and then it covers a, a considerable amount of step in a very short time. In fact, if you then attach this gold particle, um, that will be even much shorter. And they unfortunately uh, can't do that. But this gold particle attachment is the last year. I think maybe um, Tomishige has done a similar experiment on uh, Kaneshi. Uh, again, showing that the fusion consumes most of the uh, stepping. Um, it's quite random. So, so you can think of this as a two-stage two relaxation, but we can calculate all this stuff. And uh, we, I, I'll explain this, and I'll also make a comment that Yale mailed to me that made us uh, think about this light chain problem uh, a little bit. <clears throat> so the. The hydrodynamics of the of associated with the bead, which is really gigantic, um, uh, can be in, in principle computed, and when you compute that, uh, the red uh, dots are from uh, uh, Dunham's footage and uh, the theory that we predict uh, with this bead hydrodynamics is in black. And you can hardly quarrel, quarrel with, the, with the accuracy of uh, the predictions. All right, and that's a formula at the bottom for how to compute this. Um, oh, the, 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 the let, me, uh, let me make this. So Yale pointed out that in his experiment, uh, this is a biophysics journal, um, that um, I think they use light chain. Yale can speak of it is there. Um, they get very similar binding. And so we reanalyzed uh, that by taking the hydrolysis rates into account. And we were more or less able to rationalize uh, 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 the experiments of Yale, and, and, and I, 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 will, I will at some point write it in the Yale. <clears throat> okay. Before I explain this, let's look at the schematic diagram of our model. Uh, and, and, and this is something that we're working on now. The Our assumption was that, that the angle between the two lever arms is totally free once it detaches, which means you can view this junction as kind of like a jointed chain of two summer flexible rays. And for some reason, um, um, Sellers is, thinks that it's constrained, actually. It doesn't explore all the you know, 360 or 180, however you want to define it. And that results in some changes in the step size distribution and we are, we are, we are in the process of solving that out uh, by reworking the theory of that. Although, personally, I'm not sure why that should be so. I can understand that the crowding effects, uh, the angle cannot be, uh, uh, you cannot fully explore this, but in, uh, in just water, I don't see why that angle should be constrained. Um, the stall force is, exactly cal calculable. It's got this blue part and the green part. The blue part is just structural part. And the green part is chemical cycle effects, like G and B, gating ratio, money penalty, and the recovery stroke. And um, but for the parameters that we use, we can calculate the, um, the stall force coming from structure, stall force coming from from chemistry, and you can see most of it is from structure and a little bit of chemistry. All right, um, I, I, I have to go pretty soon uh, before I hand over Mike uh, uh, tomorrow. And uh, um, uh, one advantage of developing theories like this is that you can test the robustness of uh, the movement of motors like this, uh, where we have done enough reasonable job in getting agreement with experiments on how robust is it to changes in parameters. So what, you, what is being plotted here is a chemistry change, which is probably very difficult to difficult to engineer. I'm not sure about that. Uh, um, as a function of uh, this power stroke effective parameter that's structural, the uh, numbers like 1.8, 1.3.x, x, etc. are the run length that we impose. And then with the condition, uh, that the ratio of the 
backward to the forward step probabilities, at f equal to zero should be small, 1%, but you can change it to whatever you want. And the stall force should come out to be in the region in, in the neighborhood of 250 meters. With these constraints, you can solve the equations, and it's, you can see for in this blue region is where you can have a motor, not, not necessarily the wild type motor, that would be quite possessive. Uh, and, 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 and if you, the red dot is where the wild type is. But the B is hard to change, at least in my head. So we looked at something that may be easier to change, when, namely the constraint strength with which the head binds to actin, and the persistence line. This, of course, uh, you know, a, a good polymer that can change it, maybe it's easily changeable. And again, it's the same criterion. And you can see there's a lot of space in which you can engineer minus and five for it to be processor with the same criterion that is mostly most forward and uh, et cetera, et cetera. OK, everybody says. Nice. So this is my last thing. Oops, this is my last thing I'm going to show you. There is this fantastic paper which I only read many years ago, but we got to reread it. Uh, the Zev Bryan guy, Nature Nanotechnology, fooling around with mice in six. Okay. Yep. And I think he made some minimal changes. The minus six is mice in six is a minus ten directed motor. He made some minimal changes. Mutations, right? I think it changed the lever arm, the structure of the lever arm. Yeah, so okay. Mauro says the structure of the lever arm. I remember the mutations, but anyway. Um, and then you could easily make it uh, be bidirectional. So the motor works both forward and back as you can probably. So we went into our theory, and, and I'm just going to show you this, and looked at the. So these black lines that you see are obtained with a condition, a uh, different con uh, 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 um, uh, run lengths. Maybe one micron, something like that, and um, and uh, with the criterion that the ratio of the forward to the backward probability should be half, which means that we want mice and five to be bidirectional. And this is really the reason why we started this stuff, and uh, so it's just for our own curiosity. And you can see that we think that you can make it so. Actually, you can make and and we have results for. Other variables like persistence length is as L, et cetera, et cetera. And we think that by just fooling around with the lever arm, I finally, as, as Brian did, you can also make uh, uh, mice and five bidirectional. If somebody does it and is and 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 the way they do it is roughly the way we suggest, it means that the model that we created is not totally back off. So that's all. That's all. So we, because currently we're relying on comparisons to experiment, and we also want to make some predictions. So um, let me see this. This is a this is a this is a this is a picture from uh, Sun and Goldman six years ago. Gee, I didn't know it was that long. Um, somehow, so you, you can see my and five is 150. Uh, nanometers, according to them, it is more or less what is used. Um, Mice in six, they say, is one nanometer. We haven't quite figured out what the lever arm is in Mice in six, actually. I mean, people have it, we haven't. Um, and then, then, then we are, we are, we are, we are uh, um, in the very early stages. Uh, Working with uh, Yale and, uh, and Matthew on, on modeling mice in CAN, uh, which is uh, a very simple model, even simpler than what Mara is going to tell you uh, of mice in six. Okay, this is just uh, that's all I got to say, and I got to go. I, I can hang around for five minutes if somebody wants to ask me something, but that's it. Any questions? So I, I have a question. Um, so I think the um, 
the optical trapping experiments are pretty convincing that um, chemomechanical coupling, so that the effect of load on the ATPase has a pretty substantial effect on, um, on the minus and five walking and the load dependence of how fast it can walk along. But your model doesn't really consider that at all. So I was wondering. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, what, 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 what? The convincing what? So the uh, the laser trap experiments are pretty convincing. That? That um, load affects the dwell time, the attachment duration of the motor. Load means the, force. load means the external force? External force, yeah. So um, yeah, forces that compose the power stroke have oh. pretty substantial effects on the rate of ADP release, which is this rate that you don't change in your model. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, um, first of all, it is very easy for us to change it. <laughs> because the general expressions we write down are not for the specific numbers that we use. It is really in terms of ADP release, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's easy for us to change and see what the consequences are. We haven't done that, but, but Mike, you should probably send me this paper is because after we wrote this paper, we got sidetracked on various things. So we never really returned to Mice and Five, although we're now thinking about some aspects of Mice and Five. Uh, and so if you send me this paper, is, we, can, we can figure this out. I mean, yeah, within the theoretical framework. The point I want to make is the theory is extremely general, actually. Um, and we chose these parameters to, to understand those curves, um, uh, uh, force velocity, and et cetera, and now step statistics. So extension, uh, and also, uh, although I didn't show you this, uh, what happens when you have light chains as opposed to this heavy chains, which changes the hydrolysis rates. So we can do this. It'll be great if you can send us that. Uh, send me. Send us that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Any other questions? So I have one, but uh, it wasn't he going to let Mauro talk about this? So is your time for that? Or so so the, so our one of our issues here today is that we really need to be done promptly at three. Three. So, yeah. Oh, oh shoot. I'm I'm sorry. I wish you told me this. I'm going to shut up then. Okay. He can tell you in five okay. minutes. So, so Mauro, uh, I think you need to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll be in the past. So, see you guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Dave. So, lock the door. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I uh, part of this. Um, actually, pretty much the, the entire the uh, presentation I I already done it some time ago there when I visited, um, but and I I will describe so uh, a little bit of work that has been that I have done uh, in Dave's group um, doing a, a, a making a coarse grain model for uh, my using six, um, so it's uh, more computational, less theoretical in a certain way, and uh, and it. it uh, it's about a different myosin that has some interesting properties, uh, remarkably uh, walks towards the minus end of the actin filament and has some interesting structural transition that are shown in these figures here you know, for the free power stroke and the rigor state in which the, the converter swings during the transition from free power strokes to the rigor state and there is an orange drawn uh, uh, modulin bind uh, alpha helix that sort of wrap around uh, the converter domain and uh, changes the direction of motion with respect to myosin five. So that, that that's a key difference. But there are a number. There were there have been a number of interesting reports, also from Professor Goldman and uh, other people, um, ab about uh, the fact that uh, um, the, the the lever arm and uh, converter domain region of myosin six should be pliant. And to try to investigate the structural reason of this pliancy, we run uh, specifically some coarse grain simulations of the transition uh, from uh, the pre power stroke to the rigor state. Now, uh, very uh, shortly, in a coarse grain model, it's a, this is a very a sketch of what it represents on the left. I have uh, uh, four um, short uh, uh, peptide or few amino acids in water. 
and those would be described with a standard uh, uh, molecular dynamic simulation, so using uh, you know Newton equation of motion. Um, in a coarse grain model, you just describe use uh, the, the describe the same system with a subset of beads using Brownian equation of motion, and of course uh, this allows you to have a, a you know simpler description, coarser of course description. And uh, it allows you, of course, to save time, which means uh, running longer simulations, and which means running simulations with larger systems. Specifically, we uh, in Davis Group, uh, some of these former students and postdocs have developed a model, which is called self-organized polymer model, in which essentially there are three types of interaction. There is a uh, Penny interaction, which uh, essentially it's a bonded interaction between consecutive beads. A native contact interaction, which means uh, the interaction between the beads that are within a distance of eight angstroms or less uh, from in the native structure and that have an interaction which displays a minimum in the energy and um, uh, which displays a minimum in the energy and uh, and it's only uh, considered for uh, uh, so if, you, if you are sufficiently close in the native state, and then there is a non-native interaction, which instead it's purely repulsive and makes the polymer self-avoiding. Now the reasons I uh, this, describe the reasons why these models are of interest, and uh, so they are, they have few parameters. The parameters are shown here, and only three of them are really relevant: the energy of native interaction, of repulsive interaction, and the sides, the distances that you are considering for uh, for, for the, the, the native context. Um, they have, and these models are very good in describing collective motion and thermodynamical experiments. Now, specifically in the, the sub model that I've developed is a model only for the myosin six head and the lever arm up to the only IQ domain of the lever arm. The actin filament is only used for references that was actually not part of the model. And I developed a model in which the information of both the pre power stroke and rigor conformation are simultaneously present. And the energy of the pre-power stroke gets a little weakened in such a way that I start from pre-power stroke, I stay in pre-power stroke for a short while, and then move towards rigor. And I want to see uh, what happens in, during this transition. I ran 96 Brownian dynamic simulation of this transition, and here I can show you um, the majority of in the majority of the trajectories I see this kind of behavior. So this is the myosin 16 from above in black is acting. Uh, this Blue is the converter, orange is insert two. And if you look at what happens at the beginning, it's in pre-power stroke, then the converter rapidly swings towards uh, the, uh, the, the, the rigor conformation. And only afterwards, the lever arm starts to rotate and finally it reaches the rigor conformation. Um, you can see that there is some kind of a hinge of the rotation of the lever arm, which is represented by a red bead here and it's uh, I identified it as the residue number 785, but it's roughly around that region there is a rotation that, that, that occurs of the lever arm. But the important message is that it appears to follow the movement of the converter. Um, this can be followed also in another way by looking at the series of contact, the red, the green, and the blue one. If you look at the black line here, which represents a collective coordinate of the monitoring the transition from pre-power stroke to rigor uh, at large times, you see that the red contact is formed. It's not formed at the beginning, and it's formed after a short while, and that corresponds to the first jump of this collective coordinate. And then the second, then there is a long waiting time, and the second jump corresponds to the formation of the, of the green and the blue contact. The red contact monitors the movement of the converter in blue, and the red, blue, and the green contact monitor the closure of the lever arm on top of the motor domain. If uh, you look at these uh, trajectories, uh, like I've shown here, you can see that they are stochastic. This is, uh, the red and blue uh, lines um, represent the position of the tip of the lever arm during a couple of trajectories, and then you see that they are pretty much all over the place. It's not a directed movement. So it, it's a stochastic movement. Uh, collecting that information, you can extract the probability of being at a certain angle for the lever arm with respect to actin and extracting an equivalent of free energy. This free energy is pretty small. The transition, it's a couple of kBT. And so this body of evidence suggests that uh, the lever arm is indeed uncoupled from the motor domain. And with uncoupled in this case, I mean, 
specifically that the converter swings before uh, the lever, uh, before the lever arm and only afterwards the lever arm uh, recoupled. Uh, I think I'm sh rapidly running out of time, so I will not describe this. I just wanted to get to this comparison with experiments, which are some experiments that have been conducted in uh, Professor Goldman uh, lab a few years ago in 2007. And uh, the histogram is the data from uh, uh, their paper. And it represents the orientation with respect to the actin filament of a probe attached to a commodulin in myosin 6. The lines are uh, the results from the simulations without any fitting parameters uh, and for the to, for the the leading uh, for the trailing head, uh, which is considered to be in rigor, and for the leading head, which is considered to be in this uncoupled state. So the the, the rotation of the converter occurs, but the lever arm it's forbidden to rotate forward because it's pulled backward by a force of six piganewton, which is a little large, but actually, being given the fact that the lever arm is so short, um, it doesn't consider all the extension of the lever arm. If you do the math, it's actually not an unreasonably large. No. Um, I think I can stop here. Uh, I, I don't know if it's great. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? No, any questions from off-site? I don't know if there's anyone left listening. They're listening. There's one or two live mics. Yeah. Okay. No? Well, thank you so much for giving us a very uh, complicated talk in about eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope it was clear enough. I, I wasn't sure about the time, and so I, I ran fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks so much. So, so uh, I'm not exactly sure. What the date of our next meeting is? It hasn't been. So on September, I said. Yeah. So we'll we'll next meet in September, uh, and it's uh, it's been great. So thanks for your participation and have a great uh, vacation.